The Bitter Side of Sweet, Chapter 7 Your Brother The words echo hollowly in my head, and for a moment I don't process them. They're nothing but sounds without any meaning. Then it hits me. Seydu. He's talking about Seydu. Beside me, Khadija's head snaps up, and she makes a small noise. At any other time today, this would make this would have made me happy, but my problems have suddenly gotten so much bigger that I don't even look at her. I jump to my feet and scan the faces of the boys who have already arrived. He's nowhere to be seen. Musa is still looking at me. I take a step closer to him, not sure my voice will carry. Say do, I choke out. Yes, says Musa flatly. He got hurt today and isn't going to be able to work until he gets better. Hurt? My heart starts beating again when he says that word, and it's only then that I could admit to myself that I thought Seydu might be dead. My stomach twists painfully, and I want to throw up, but don't. Musa gives me a thin-lipped smile. I guess he just wasn't able to manage without the help of his big brother. Shame you weren't there to protect him. Where is he? I ask. My voice is tight and shaky. Musa waves toward the edge of the clearing. His team should be back soon. They're moving slowly since they have to carry him. And with that, he turns away from me and busies himself feeding the fire. I run to the other boys. Did you see Seydu today? I ask them. But the ones who answer say no. I pace the clearing by the fire in tight circles, shaking out my hands in nervousness, waiting for Seydu's crew. Every time I look, I see Musa staring at me. His eyes are mirrors. I can't see anything behind them. Unsure what he's thinking, I don't take a chance on any more questions. I turn away from him and continue pacing. How much longer will he be? Where are they? And then suddenly, there they are. The shadowy greenery off to one side of the camp shivers, and then Salif and the other five boys who went with him that morning pop into the clearing, except one of them isn't walking. For a moment I stand there, then I'm sprinting across the clearing, to see the limp body that's stretched on a pod sack being carried by a boy at each corner. They leave a dark trail behind them. The cloth is dripping blood. I run so hard I have trouble stopping and I nearly smash into Modibo. I grab his arm to steady myself and look into the hammock he's straining to carry. But then I'm frozen again, hands still on his arm because I don't know what to do next. Seydu is sprawled in the dip of the sack, his long skinny legs hanging off, his heels covered in dust from where they've been dragging. His head lolls to the side, and I can tell he's not really conscious right now. But that's probably a good thing because there's blood everywhere. So much blood. It's very wet and very red. So he must have been injured not long ago. Get off, Modibo pulls away from me. You can look when we get to the fire. He's heavy. I trail along after them, watching miserably as Sadu's heels bump across the ground. When they get to the edge of the fire, the boys set down the sack and leave, stretching their arms and cracking their necks as if they'd carried a large sack of cacao, not my brother. The sack with Sadu on it is now spread in front of the fire. The firelight plays across his face, highlighting his slightly sunken temples and eyes. I try not to think about how skinny he is most of the time, but right now I can't avoid how little of him there is in this world. I sink beside him on my knees and rest my hand softly on his forehead. His face looks peaceful, smoothed out in the light like he's asleep. I know it's only because he's unconscious that he looks like that, but it makes my heart twist anyway. Oh, say do I manage. Tears are choking my voice, but I don't even care. Seydu's not awake to hear me, and the rest of them can all go to hell as far as I'm concerned. They didn't keep him safe. No, you didn't keep him safe. I shudder and force myself to look at my brother more carefully. There, that's why he won't be able to work anymore. I see a dirty rag wrapped tightly around Seydu's arm, soaked in blood. His chest is bare, and I realize that the rag must be his shirt. I look over the rest of him, all blessedly in one piece. But there's so much blood, I wonder how bad the cut is. A heavy hand on my shoulder makes me jump. I whirl around. Musa is standing behind me, a small bag in his hand. Let's have a look, he says. I scoot over and Musa kneels beside me to unwrap the shirt tied around Sadu's arm. I don't know what to do, so I just stay put. The bandage is dripping, soaked through, so it comes off Sadu's arm easily. The wet shirt hits the ground with a soft slap, and Musa looks at me sharply. 
It's the only way I know that I've made a noise. It's a disaster. A deep, jagged-edged gash slices down Sadu's forearm, biting through the base of his hand. I see the pulp and meat of his arm and a white thing lurking in the red of his wrist that might be a bone. When Musa pinches the two edges of skin together, blood pours out of the sides. Sadu doesn't move. I start to get really worried. Hold this here, Musa says to me, gesturing with chin to where he's holding Sadu's arm in place. I reach forward tentatively and cut my brother's wrist between my hands. I put my two thumbs around it and replace Musa's fingers holding the mangled forearm together. I have trouble looking at the wound, but I don't want to look away. So instead, I stare at my thumbs, examining the dirt under my fingernails. Musa digs around in the bag beside him. A minute later, he leans forward with a spool of black thread and a needle. What are you going to do? I ask, my voice husky. I have to sew it shut. Hopefully that will stop the bleeding enough for him to get better, Musa shrugs. One way or the other, we'll do this quickly. Part of me hates Musa right now, but the rest of me is so grateful to him for showing up and knowing what to do that I don't say anything as he bends over Sade and binds the edges with large, irregular stitches. It takes a lot of stitches. How did this happen? I ask as he rethreads the needle. Musa looks at me before bending over the work in front of him again pulling the thread slowly through the muscle and skin of Sadu's arm, tying him back together. From what I hear, he was reaching around the trunk of a tree to pull at a pod, just as another boy was swinging to cut it. The boy cut him instead. I want to ask who the boy was. A rage so pure and white burns inside of me that I think I'll find the boy and kill him with my bare hands. But I don't let myself ask the question, even though Musa has one eyebrow, eyebrow raised, waiting for it. I can't trust myself with what I'd do with the information once I had it. Because really, it's not that boy's fault. Sadu should have known better. But he didn't. I would never have cut a pod when his hand was there. Because I'm always looking to see where his hands are, what he's doing, whether he's safe. He's so used to being with me that he's never learned the common sense of a crew. Don't put your hand around a tree when other people are cutting in the area. So really, it's my fault the other boy cut him. I look away from Musa and keep my mouth shut. Musa shrugs and goes back to his stitching. His stitchings pull at Sadu's swelling skin, and the little black knots look like rows of ugly birds flying down his arm and onto his hand. Find something to wrap it with, says Musa, and tie it tight. He wipes the needle off on his pants puts it and the thread into the little sack and walks away from us to where the other crews have prepared dinner. I cradle, I cradle Sadu's head in my lap. I'm not sure if I should use his shirt from before or not. On the one hand, it's covered in blood and dirt and it's wet. I'm not sure if you're supposed to wrap stitches in wet cloth or not. On the other hand, the, shirt's not, the shirt is ruined for wearing and I don't really have many other options unless I use my shirt. I sit there for a minute, undecided, and then I take Sadu's shirt to the water pump. The metal handle flakes rust into my palm as I crank it, but after a few full arm pushes, I'm rewarded with a gush of water from the spout. I hold Sadu's shirt under the spout with one hand and pump with the other, squeezing the cloth in my hand as I go. The air in the shirt bubbles out through the fabric when I squeeze it, and the whole thing frosts red over my hands. I try not to let the mingled smell of my brother's blood and my own fear turn my stomach. Instead, I pump harder and scrub the shirt between my fists, imagining it's the face of the boy who cut him. By the time the water runs clear through the shirt, I'm standing in a red mud puddle that fills the wrinkles on the tops of my toes. I wring the shirt out and head to where Sadu's lying. I want to rip the shirt into strips, one to bandage him, one to wash him off, one to leave cool on his face. But we don't have the luxury of destroying a shirt for comfort. So instead, I fold it in three and then wrap it tightly around his arm, tying the sleeves in a knot to hold it together. As I pull the ends of the knot, Sadu cries out, Sadu? He starts keening in response, a high, awful sound. I look wildly around the camp, but no one tells me what to do. 
I noticed that Khadija stood up and has come as close to us as her chain will allow, but she's still far away, and no one else is coming any closer. Hey there, I say, low and soft, pulling him against me. I've got you now. It's me, Amadou. It's your brother. I've got you now. You're safe. I know your arm hurts, but Musa stitched it up, and soon you'll be all better. I just know it. Shh. I mumble on with whatever ridiculous things I can think of to call him, but he continues to sob, and tears roll down his face. When he thrashes, he tries to make a fist with his hurt hand, but only three fingers bend. I taste bile in my mouth and force myself to smile. It'll get better. It'll get better, I say to myself. Clumsily, I lift Sadu into my arms, trying not to pinch his injured arm between our bodies. The ridges of the scars on his back rub against my fingers. I carry him to the pump and set him down a little bit away from the puddle I made before. Then I peel off my own shirt and wet it like I did for Khadija. I do the best I can to scrub the rest of Sadu's body. When I'm done, he looks cleaner, but without the layer of dirt and blood, he looks almost gray. I don't think I've ever seen anybody look as pale as my little brother in that moment, and I'm afraid. Now, thoroughly wet, Sadu is shivering, so I pull on my soaked shirt, pick him up again, and go sit close to the fire. I pull his head onto my lap and stretch his legs toward the warmth. One of the other boys offers me a bowl of stew, but Sadu won't eat it, and I can't. I shake my head. And eventually the boy leaves. I sit and rock Sadu until the bosses come and make us go into the sleeping hut. Yusuf comes over and helps lift Sadu into my arm. I pull away from him. You were there today, my eyes say. I don't know if I can trust you. I'm sorry, he whispers, and then he walks away before I can let myself think about what Yusuf might be sorry for. I stagger under Sadu's weight into the sleeping hut. There's a general quiet rustling and murmuring as the rest of the boys settle for the night. I head to our usual corner and lay Sidu gently on the dirty straw. Then I hear the clink of a chain. I look up and to see Khadija being shoved into the sleeping hut with the rest of us just before the big door swings shut, blocking out the last traces of light from the fire. I feel a small pang. In all my worry about Sadu, I had forgotten about her. Good luck, says a faceless dry chuckle from the other side of the door, and I hear the bolt being thrown and the padlock click, closed. For a heartbeat, the entire hut is silent. Then I hear a whistle from the corner near the door where the oldest boys sleep. Hey, pretty girl, says a voice in the darkness, come sleep over here. There's a wave of soft laughter among the rest of the boys. I can, I can tell it's a joke, said to break the awkward silence but Khadija doesn't know it. She screeches wordlessly. A clatter follows, and I realize she must have tripped over someone in her hurry to get away from Whistler. You get pretty good at seeing with your ears after two years in the dark. Ow! Another voice, this time from the person she must have fallen on. The laughter gets louder. Khadija sobs. In an instant, I'm standing, following the sound, sliding my feet along the ground, so I know when to step over a boy instead of bumping into him. Part of me can't believe that I've left my hurt brother to help a girl I didn't even know existed four days ago, but I have to. The other boys may not know what she went through last night, but I do. And while I couldn't do anything to change what happened then, I can do something about this. I get to the front of the hunt. Stop, I say loudly to the sleeping hut at large. There's a startled break in the laughter. Come on, Khadija, I say, and reach my hand through the arms toward her. I touch her, and for a second, she recoils. Amadou? Her voice is shaky. Yes, it's me. A soft hand grabs mine, and I pull her forward. Try not to step on anyone. Sadu's in the corner. The older boys recover the quickest, and as we shuffle to the back of the sleeping hut, I get some colorful suggestions about what I can do with my new girlfriend, and a few fuzzy threats about what they'll do to me if I ever give orders again. I ignore them. I'm one of the biggest boys here, and pretty much everyone knows better than to mess with me. My foot bumps gently into a leg. It pulls out of the way. Just about there, says Yusef, helping me orient myself. I turn slightly and creep forward until I hear Sadu's jagged breathing, then I sit. Khadija settles beside me with a jingle. She's close enough that I can feel the heat raiding off her body, as well as Sadu's. 
There's a slim sound from her chains that makes me think she's shaking. It's all right, I say softly, hoping none of the others can hear me. It was only a joke. She doesn't answer, and since the joke isn't really worth defending, I leave it at that. We're in the corner now, I tell her. If you're careful, you step over safely between him and the wall. I'll be out here. After a long moment of silence, I hear her rustle and clank her way to follow my suggestion. Now that the area around me is clear again, I stretch out beside Sadu. The whistles and joke continue for a while, but I don't say anything. And one by one, the voices drop away as the boys in the hut fall asleep. Everyone had a long day of work today and is facing another one tomorrow. No joke is better than sleep. I only wish I could join them. Instead, as quiet settles into the hut and the noises of the night bush take over, I stare at the ceiling and wonder what on earth I'm going to do now that I have two hurt people to look out for instead of one. I don't sleep well that night, waking whenever Sedu moves or cries out. I touch his face in the dark and my hand comes away feeling warm. I touch his arm in the dark and my hand comes away feeling wet. Neither of these comfort me and when I do sleep, I dream I'm walking across ankle deep fields of blood while lying black birds pull to their wounds in the sky only to find myself standing by a yawning grave. I wake up shaking, my heart thudding in my chest and my breathing rapid. I clutch Sedu to me. When the bosses open the doors the next morning, I feel like I live in another world. I don't see right, don't hear right. It takes Musa slapping the head to get me to move out of the sleeping hut to the fire with the other boys. Sedu still clutched in my arms, Khadija clanking shadow behind me. Now that my initial terror gone, I realize how heavy Sedu is. I walk stooped like an old man, shuffling one foot in front of the other to the pump, where I peel the bandage off Sedu's arm, wash it out, and put it on him, since I don't know what else to do. He yells and thrashes around when I touch him, but he's so weak, it doesn't take much to hold him still. I splash water onto his hot face and try to direct some into his mouth. Most dribbles down his chin. But I'm rewarded when I see the bump in his throat move, showing that he's drinking at least something. I look up when Musa stands in front of me. Eat. He hands me a bowl. I want to scream at him to take it away. I want to tell him I'm not hungry. I want to beg him to save my brother. But when I open my mouth, no words come out. Musa puts the bowl in my hands and takes Sedu from me. Eat. He says again, I do. Musa turns around and walks back into the sleeping hut carrying Sadu. I get to my feet and follow along behind them. Khadija still by my side. Wait, I say wait. But Musa ignores me and I'm not sure what I want to wait for anyway. So I make myself finish the bowl of whatever it is as I follow them into the semi-darkness. The inside of the sleeping hut is dim with speckles of bright morning sun slicing through the tiny cracks in the siding and along the ground where the walls disappear into the floor. Because the doors open behind me, I can see more than I usually can. The piles of dried grass and cloth scraps that the boys have moved around to make sleeping areas for themselves. The shadow line dents in the dirt floor that show where someone has slept for many months. What our sleeping area where Moose is laying Sadu, pulling grass from nearby piles for under his head. His movements are gentle, and I'm grateful to him for that. I hover in the doorway and watch. Musa looks at me. Go fill a bucket with water and bring what, whatever's left of that soup. You, he continues to Khadija, help me with his head. To my surprise, she obeys and goes to Sedu. When I get back to the sleeping hut with the bucket of water and the half bowl of soup I was able to take from the other boys, Khadija's sitting on the ground beside my brother and Musa standing off to one side looking at both of them in disgust. Listen closely, Amadou, Musa says when I get to them. In five minutes, we're going to leave for the day of work. You will be coming with us. I'm going to leave this girl in here with your brother. He looks at the watch he's so proud of on his wrist. You have four and a half minutes to persuade her to take good care of him. With that, Musa strides out of the sleeping hut and into the morning sunshine. Out of sight, I hear him shouting at the boys to get their tools and form work crews. A distant part of my brain notes that being the last one in line, I won't get a good blade. But the thought is such a small problem that I actually laugh. Khadija looks up. 
I put the bucket of water beside her and hand her the extra bowl of soup. Do your best, I say. I'll be back as soon as I can. She doesn't say anything to me, but takes the bowl. I brush my hand softly over Sadu's face. He whimpers. I rearrange the pile of grass under his head, trying to make him more comfortable. Then I lean over and rest my forehead against his burning one. You stay alive, I whisper to him fiercely. You stay alive until tonight. You hear me? But Sadu's eyes are wild and feverish, staring past me, and I don't know if he's heard me or not. Amadou! Musa barks from outside. Now! I turn at the sound of Musa's irritation and get up to leave. A hand darts out of the shadows and grabs my ankle. I look at Khadija in surprise. She's looking at Sadu, lying there, making mewling noises of pain. Her fingers squeeze my ankle tightly, and she looks up. Hurry, she says. I'll do the best I can. It's the first thing she said, other than my name, since it happened. I Nietzsche, I whisper and walk out. Musa closes the door behind me, padlocking it shut. Get a machete, he says, and heads into the trees where the last group is disappearing into the green. I walk to the tool shed and pick up the last machete. I was right. It's the worst one. But as I swing the cracked, warped handle in my hand and grab a sack, I feel lighter because the wildcat agreed to take care of my brother. And a bad machete is a very, very small problem.